So uh, thank you all for joining. My name is Chris Carrick. I'm the founder of Seacoast Paddleboard Club. Uh, we really appreciate everyone taking the time out of their day to join us for what is our first paddle chat. Uh, obviously, we're living in some strange times right now, so I thought, you know, it was really important to get the community together, you know, here in New Hampshire as well as New England and across the country to come together, you know, keep learning and keep the stoke up, really keep the, op- you know, keep everyone optimistic. You know, we're going to get through this. Um, you know, for those of you who aren't familiar with Seacoast Battle Board Club, I want to take kind of a brief minute to talk about who we are, what we do. Uh, we are, for, first and foremost, a social club. We were formed back in 2015 in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. Uh, we have just shy of 100 members who actively paddle in New Hampshire, Maine, and Massachusetts. And our club motto is to get people out on the water, have fun, and give back. So in addition to hosting regular meetup paddles, you know, Secrets Paddleboard Club and our members host a lot of charity paddles. We do beach cleanups together. We do a lot of things both on and off water as a community, uh, just looking to give back, uh, you know, to the greater Seacoast. If you'd like to learn more about Seacoast Paddleboard Club, please check us out at SeacoastPaddleboard.com. And really a couple of housekeeping things. First and foremost, I wanted to start this webinar by saying thank you. I mean, gratitude is something that we all try and practice. And right now, you know, I know there's some key people from the club that aren't here that couldn't make it because they are literally on the front lines of this. So they are with us in spirit, and we are keeping them in our thoughts. So, again, thank you to all our nurses and essential staff and workers for getting out there and doing what they do to keep the country running right now. And just a few housekeeping rules. Obviously, this webinar is being recorded. You will be able to access this after. Um, for that in mind, we keep everyone on mute. If you do have a question, as you've seen kind of earlier, just raise your hand and use the chat box feature. And Jeremy or myself will do our best to get answer your question. Uh, and then, if possible, just refrain to asking questions at the end of the presentation. With that in mind, today's webinar, How to Overcome Fear, is being presented by Jeremy Vane. Um, very stoked to have Jeremy. I've uh, been Jeremy for a while now. He is a former professional wakeboarder. He began his paddleboard career in 2011. Is that correct, Jeremy? I'm thinking it is. That is, yeah. A few years right on. Ago. That's sweet. And since then, Jeremy's really established himself as one of the most recognized and respected personalities in the paddleboard industry. Uh, he's worked in almost every facet of the business, from being a professional athlete and team coach to work on the product and brand development side of things. So with that, I'm really excited to welcome Jeremy Vane. Jeremy, take it away. Yeah, thanks, Chris. And thank you guys all for uh, showing up today and taking time out of your Sunday to, to join me. And if you hear some puppies in the background, that's just my dogs getting a little excited about uh, being indoors on this 41 degree day here in New England. So um, I want to jump right in, obviously, with the uniqueness of today um, in the world we're in, you know, obviously, there is a massive part of fear in our lives. Um, you know, no matter what we do, it's, there's definitely a scary time. So it, it plays into a lot, but this whole webinar is not about what's going on today, but just some tools that, that I've found upon, you know, as an athlete and then as a coach and how it's helped me quite a bit to be able to overcome. So I want to jump right there in that. And I'm going to go into a little story. And, and for me, paddling has been a pretty amazing tool to be able to, help break down the walls of our fears right so some people are afraid of heights for me that's what gets me um definitely afraid of heights others it's water um others is it's tight confined spaces so so on so forth right and and when we get into that fearful mode we lose all cognitive function of life and where i started to stumble upon this when i was really getting into stand-up paddleboarding at a, in 2011 and teaching beginner lessons I remember talking to people that didn't, they actually found themselves unable to figure out left and right. And these are as smart, educated adults. And I was like really tripping out on how they couldn't 
take a paddle on from the left side and move it to the right when I said, hey, just move your paddle to the right. So I started to dive into this deeper. And then as a sup yoga instructor, it really became even more uh, obvious that when we have a fear stricken moment, we are just in a panic state and all we are allowed to do is react. And so how do we prevent that from happening? Because sometimes it can be, you know, and if we're out surfing and a wave, we just had a hold down, even if it's for three seconds, the next wave we miss all of a sudden we could be in a, in a tough place. So um, what I want to do is basically give you guys some tools. And so the beauty of paddling is it helps us overcome our fears and each day, each time we put ourselves into a situation, it allows us to learn a little bit more. Um, so basically in a nutshell, you know, for me, I talk a lot about, um, the comp competition side of, of fear and how it plays into it, but there's also the, the recreation side, you know, so anybody that's ever taken out a new paddle into the water, um, and watch that person just freeze and, and go down and say, Hey, I can never stand up. I'm never going to stand up. They're in a moment of fear, right? So how do we help them enjoy what we love, which is paddling in the water? So we have to just start with the most basic thing. And, and what I say by that is um, looking at the whole situation. And the first thing you'll notice when we get into a fear state is our breath becomes really short. And the moment our breath becomes really short, we then trip off this fight or flight, basically defensive mechanism that was ingrained in our subconscious. And it becomes very hard to change it. Now, as we change the breath and go from this almost hyperventilating place to a little bit longer, um, then all of a sudden we start to calm. And it's ironic, but the statement of just take a breath or just breathe from years ago has a lot of validity to it. So we need to just take our time and breathe and that will start to lower our anxiety and the stress levels and allow us to be able to not only help ourselves, but help the person with us. Um, so that's one of the things that I love to, to look at um, on doing so. And, you know, the the piece that there's a lot of breathing exercises out there and one of my favorites um to do and is is basically it's a four second count um and so we inhale for four seconds pause for four seconds exhale for four seconds pause for four seconds and that little drill right there of just moving the breath work it's called box breathing as we move the breath in and we always want to do this through our nose it actually helps us start to calm um, so that's one of the things that we can always do. So I always talk with people about as you're entering towards the water. Now in sup yoga and that aspect, like I'll do this on land if somebody is already in that panic state, right? So we start to tap into that breath work in about three to five rounds, all of a sudden our anxiety starts to fade away and that voice. So the typically what happens in that fear thing. So obviously you now talked about the subconscious, the next piece. And many of us have heard this and we talk to ourselves about it all the time. The inner voice becomes our biggest critic. And so that voice starts to build a story and the story starts to get a little bit aggressive and, and very negative. And it's all these what ifs, um, you know, and if you think about go back to a scenario where you're late one day heading into the office and it's a big meeting and the mind starts to tell us all the things that possibly can go wrong from us being late. Well, the reality is until we walk into that meeting room, we never know, you know, the same thing on the water. You know, it's one of my, my favorite things I talk about is when we go out and paddling, you know, we start to instantly think about the 25 foot great white shark that's going to be underneath us, even though we're paddling in a lake. You know, we have this, the, oh my God, what, what is below the surface? Well, we're in New England, we're in a lake, it's fresh water. We're pretty dang safe. There's really nothing down there. But our mind has already got these stories. Well, what if this happened? What, what if? What, what happens if there's a snake? What happens if there's an alligator or somebody released? And ne next thing you know, we're down this rabbit hole of panic that doesn't need to be there. Um, so as we start to build this whole story in our mind, we then attach to it. 
And now we lose the present moment and we start to go down the rabbit hole and anything we're currently doing, we start to lose track of. And again, I go back to that car drive. Next thing you know, we missed our exit to the office we've been going to for 10 years because we're so far down the rabbit hole. What if, and now our paranoia goes to the next level. Now I missed my exit. Now I'm going to be more late. Yada, yada, yada. And we just need to slow everything now. So what does it go back to that breath? The thing that I also like to, to talk with people about is as we start to hear that mind, there's a couple in yoga we talk about, you know, not attaching. So not attachment to, to thought. So what does that really mean? So that voice is starting to go and you start to think about it and you're like, okay. And then you grab onto that. Oh my God, my boss is going to get mad and I'm going to hold on to that thought. Instead of holding on to that thought, you just let it go. So it just comes and goes. I always ask myself, is the thought, is the what if scenario they're building even relevant? And if it's not relevant, then what, what's the need to think about it, right? So that's the question. Is it a relevant thought? And then 99% of the time, we'll realize that it's an outlandish thought that has no reason to even be in there. The next piece, how do we break a hold of that? You can actually laugh at it. Um, so I started to laugh at, at these thoughts. You, I've been doing it more and more. Um, and there's actually a the picture of me walking through the snow is in a video I just did. It is legitimately the mental story and walking through the snow, going into basically 35 degree water, the mind will create a story that you're never going to be able to get out of that water. Like it, this is it. This is your last day. So we do things to break through these fears. So that's one of the pieces is detaching from the mind and then actually laughing at it. And there's a, there's a really good book, um, Michael Singer, a uh, really great author. He wrote The Untethered Soul and The Surrender Experiment. And if you guys get a chance, I would really recommend reading both of those books. But The Untethered Soul talks more of how to detach from the thought and the mind. And The Surrender Experiment is more about an experience of how to just surrender and now more than ever, especially in our circumstances, to just accept for what is and control what we can actually control. So with that being said, in The Untethered Soul, he talks about the mind. And if we were to ever do this, and, and I, I love this analogy, is if we were to take that voice in our head, and we're obviously social distancing, so we'll use it virtually. So if I were to plug my thoughts into this um, form right now, you all would probably be like, who is the person that continues to raise their hand and, and filling up the chat with all these questions? That's my voice. That's the inner voice of me. That's my mind talking to me through this whole thing. And every one of you would be like, Hey, like, can you please ask that thing to stop talking so much? So that's the reality, you know? And the other thing is if we were to look at that, that voice as a person and anybody else heard them speak to us in the tone they do, they'd be like, why do they talk to you that way? So you start to identify with that, that voice and that dialogue. And is it, why is it negative? What, what is it saying? And even when it is in that negative state, you just let it go. Um, so that is a big piece of this is, is the self-talk, you know, and when we grab onto a negative self-talk, we start to lose our confidence. So these pieces, you know, can they be changed of 100%? Um, it takes time, it takes work and it's identifying it. And a lot of time it's hard to be able to identify that that voice in their head is, is not us because some people be like, well, that's my gut instinct. And there is some validity to that, but there is a difference between our gut. If you notice in your gut and, and Deepak Chopra has a great thing. He says, when you have a gut feeling, it's every one of the cells in your body resonating with that thought. So if you're like, I should not go paddleboarding today. And all of a sudden you get this feeling, you're like, man, I shouldn't go out. Then that's the gut feeling. Now, if it's the mind being like, well, it looks awful sharky out there. I probably shouldn't go. Then that's a different story. So it's starting to detach and feel and allow the body. Um, and so a lot of times what we start to do is when we start listening to the heart and to the gut, that's when the decisions are made in the right manner. Um, obviously, that gets into a little deeper level of meditation and disconnect. But that's ultimately when enlightenment and all these things start to be talked about with the Buddha and some of the gurus, you know, Deepak Chopra is one of those um, people. So that's ultimately what happens. 
now bringing it back. How do we do that today? How do we work with it? Um, again, one of the, the, if you look at the background behind me, I'll move over right here. That little blue dot is my head in the water from last week when I went out and did my ice bath. So I do ice baths three days a week. The sole purpose I do my ice baths for, I know there's a lot of other great benefits. I do it to break down the mind. And as I walk through the snow covered ground, barefoot into the water that is frozen, my main goal is to just focus on a really long exhale and then a really long inhale. And I sit in the water for three minutes, neck deep, and then I head back in and I continue on that breath path. And I, so I spend three minutes in the water, a couple minutes of towel off, and then I meditate for 10 minutes. And the whole key behind that is to be able to break through. And it all started with um, an Instagram post that Wim Hof put out there. So if you don't know who Wim Hof is, Wim Hof is, I think he holds a Guinness Book of World Record for the fastest half marathon time barefoot in the Arctic. He's done some really amazing things, basically using his breath to overcome the power of the mind. And so he put up a post uh, back in September about cold showers. So I was always open to the idea of what does this cold water therapy do? I knew as an athlete that there's recovery methods, but I was like, I wanted more from it. Um, so what he said is if you can go through a 10 second cold shower, which sucks and is miserable, the next tough moment of your day, remember that cold shower and how you made it through. So setting ourselves up to be able to overcome these little battles in life is going to be the easiest way to overcome the mind. So how does that pertain to paddling? So we're brand new into the sport. You know, today's 41 degrees and miserable and all you have is two millimeter booties, no gloves and your board shorts. That's not going to set yourself up for success. It's going to put you into a bad spot, no matter how strong mentally you feel you are. So we have to assess the situation. Now, if you have a five, four wetsuit, seven mil booties and five millimeter gloves and you got your life jacket and you have a place where you can access the water granted obviously today is a unique scenario but um non-coronavirus state and you head out in the water and you're like wow i've never thought i could paddle in these conditions while you're in your wetsuit and you have your leash and your pfd on then maybe you slide in the water because you know that you're in a safe space right or you have and you have your partner with you out there paddling together the next time you go to paddle, it becomes that much easier. So you put yourselves in those conditions. Now, if it's open ocean, two foot, three foot breaking waves, and, and you've only been paddling, let's say six months or even a month, then obviously not the right conditions. It's not going to be fun. Even if you're warm, nobody wants to flail in the water for an hour on end. You know, that, that's just no fun in that because you begin to just become defeated. So, you maybe look at the water and be like, okay, so there's a light wind, you know, the, the chop is about six inches. I'm usually paddling on flat glassy water. Well, I'm going to try today. Um, and you go out with a friend and you have some playful times, you fall, but ultimately you push yourself into that area of uncomfortable. That's a great way to do it. Um, I talk a lot about technique and in, in skill drills. So one of the things is turning. A lot of us hate to turn left-handed, you know, there's a, a left-hand turn we have to take to leave the marina to get out to the water. Well, we practice that left-hand turn and we fall in the water and we enjoy the aspect of falling, then all of a sudden we start to learn because now we've taken off, we've taken away the power of the fear. Um, so doing these little things that allow us to become more comfortable, um, for I live on a small lake, uh, so you know paddling from that spot to go into the ocean can be very, very intimidating. So what I have done is on a busier weekend day, I'll go out when the water's a bit rough and it's nice and warm, and I may take a few swims. But then it allows me when I go over to the ocean and I head out, you know, in Hampton Beach and want to go and paddle out there. Then it's a little bit easier because now I've been in some rougher conditions. So just making those little tasks that much more attainable. So every time try to just make each obstacle, not a monumental one. Um, and ultimately, if we do look at today's area, if we look at right now this unprecedented time and we say, hey, we are gonna be quarantined until June. Oh my gosh, we're gonna go insane, right? But if we look at today, like what can I do today to make today a better day 
well, I'm going to do an in-house workout. I'm going to clean out my bookshelf. I'm going to read a new book. You know, wow, he mentioned Michael Singer. I'm going to go ahead and order that and, and get that book and read it. Now, tomorrow we have another little task at hand. So if we take each monumental task and break it down, we'll start to realize that it becomes obtainable. Um, so that is a few of the ways that I like to look at breaking down the fear um, and overcoming it. Uh, so I wanted to open it up and I know that's a lot of information really quick to you guys, but um, does anybody have any questions on, on this whole aspect of fear and, and tools to use and, and what we can do to, uh, to overcome fear? I see you, Jonathan. Go ahead and throw it right in the Q and A. Any questions coming in? Jonathan raised his hand. Yeah, I saw that. If you guys have questions, there's a Q&A section on the bottom of the page. Go ahead and zip one off there. Um, and if not, um, you know, and basically the way this can work too is, is Chris and I chat all the time. If you guys come up with a question later on and want to zip yeah. over an, an email or anything, you know, just let Chris know and we can always talk back into it. Um, I can share some resources as well as on these breathing exercises and other things. So um, just wanted to make sure you guys know that I didn't just talk for 20 minutes and not provide you <laughs> any sort of, uh, resources. Um, we have them, so they are available and I'll make sure we can get them to you guys. And, um, you know, obviously next time you get out in the water. Oh, that's awesome. Ellen. Thank yeah. you. Uh, yeah, no, Jeremy, I do have a question. I mean, I, I found myself surfing a couple of times, pretty big surf, you know, 10 foot plus, And I've gotten to a point where I've actually been paralyzed, paralyzed by fear, which is probably the scariest thing to be when you're out surfing. And how can you just walk me through personally, how if you find yourself in that position that the breathing exercises, you know, how can you step your what is the process there? If you can put yourself in my position, be like, okay, it's big. I'm literally, my body is shaking. How can I calm myself down? Yeah. So, you know, and that's a great, great question, Chris. And I, and I agree analogy. So obviously big pumping surf to, you know, to you at 10 foot is, is very scary to others at two foot. Right. So I'm going to use the same analogy. Um, you know, and as you walk down to the beach and you get out there and you make, and you make the paddle out and, for a lot of us, sometimes the paddle out can be, if you're paddling out at the wall, which can be gnarly because it's shore break or it's a point break and you have a hair dry paddle out and it kind of, you know, gives you this false sense of confidence. Now you're out there and, you, and you're surfing and, you, and you, you miss a wave and next thing you know, you turn around, there's this freight train of white water coming at you again. It could be two feet of white water. It can be eight feet of white water. The size is irrelevant. It's the situation. So now as we succumb to this lovely washing machine, hold our breath, um, full beat down. What happens is the moment we start to panic and tense up. And if you, if you take, we'll use 10 foot wave, a 10 foot wave will probably give you a five to eight second hold down. Eight seconds is massive hold down. If you stand right here and hold your breath for five seconds, you know, you have probably another 20 seconds. You can still hold maybe even double that. Right. So that mm. moment of even being ragdolled in the surf is you have to relax. And relaxing is the hardest thing in the world to do when you're under that duress. Now, underwater, you can't breathe, right? It's impossible. So you just have to let everything be. And this is where the surrender aspect part comes. Now, you're underneath the water surface. You're getting ragdolled. You don't know which way is up. The first thing we all can look, and again, whether it's two foot or 10 foot, the easiest thing to do is find your ankle where your leash is attached to and then climb yourself up your leash and it's going to bring you to the surface. So that right there brings us back to the surface. Next piece is get some air in our body. 
and get yourself situated for the next wave because there's going to be more coming. In time, what's going to happen is you're going to have to assess the situation, find where the beach is, I went up close to any rocks, any other surfers, and just get yourself sorted. Don't worry about your paddle if you happen to have a paddle with you. Just get comfortable and get safe. If it's a lull, you know, if that was the last wave of a set, then you can go ahead and just get some few deep breaths and get yourself to the channel or back to the beach where you can just recoup. Um, and that's a big piece right there because once you get shaken up, I always recommend everybody to get back out in the water because the moment you don't, that fear is going to compound and start to build on it. And again, we look at a two foot wave, you know, let's say you pearl your, your 11 foot board that you're out there and you get taken over the falls, you can still get beat down on a two foot wave. And next thing you know, you're like, I'm never surfing again. You know, and the reality is if you get back out there and look at the situation and start to calm, you know, then you'll be a lot better off that way. Um, so that is the way to do it. I, and I look at the same analogy as walking down to the beach, right? Like, let's say you're going your first time ever paddling. You look at the water and you're like, I, I don't, I can't paddle in this. There's wind, there's, there's current. And all of a sudden your psyche starts to just take away all your confidence and you may be a great swimmer and you might be around the water all your life, but now all of a sudden you're in your mind. So start to detach from that voice and listen to it. And that's when I started to look at the example of laughing at it. Like if it truly is building a story of, of true concern, identify with it and, and react accordingly. But a lot of times it's the worst case scenario ever. One of my creative examples is turbulence in a plane. You're in a plane, you hit turbulence, the entire plane screams. How many times have we been on a plane and we hit turbulence? Probably every time we fly, right? So that's the mind right there. That's the site. Oh my God, fear. So detach, go back to the breath. So I know that was kind of long answered, but. That was, no, uh, I, I appreciate it. That was a great answer. And we, it looks like we have some questions coming through now. So. Yeah. Um, and I know Ellen popped in here. Ellen, I'm, you know, welcome and glad you're uh, going to get, give paddleboarding a go and, you know, keep an open mind and, this is a great club to learn from. So, so keep in touch with them. Um, I'm going to read Jonathan's question out loud here. When fear comes on for me, your tip was amazing about smiling or laughing in a way it works. My question is, it seems so counterintuitive, AKA the brave face scenario that almost all coaches taught me in school. That's a great question, Jonathan. And, and this has worked for me in a lot of the standpoints and actually through, through racing um, the most is, and as I mentioned earlier, what happens is, the mind starts to build this really what if driven story. And if we attach to it, if we grab a hold of that thought, what if my paddle breaks? What if I didn't put my fin in right? Next thing you know, we're thinking about all of this and we're forgetting about paddling. So if we're out just having a great cruise around the harbor and we're worried about our fin, we might miss the dolphins go by or, you know, the beautiful ship that we've never seen before or our friends, you know, there's so many things we're going to miss out on by being in this rabbit hole of what if fear in our mind. So detach from that, let it go. Hey, if you didn't put your screw in tight enough on your fin, you're going to be doing circles in a few seconds and you're going to know about it. So, um, you know, the, the old school mentality of being tough and, and pushing through is, some people still may go that route. For me, I find humor in laughing it off starts to break that subconscious, that fight or flight mechanism. So um, great question, John, and I hope that that works. Um, next question. And it says, Jonathan, I practice the difference between anxiety and excitement in the breath. The box breath is essential, and in my experience, usually brings my focus back. When conditions change in New England so quickly, what is your best advice for newbies getting used to varying conditions? That's, that is a great question and one of my favorite. Um, so right now, and it goes back to my whole, my whole um, excitement there. Sorry, little guy. Um, no, having the right equipment is a key piece. So again, we're in New England right now. Um, I know Chris has been out in the water. Jonathan has, I have, but we have the right equipment. So first having the right gear, and I know it's an expensive investment. So if now is not the time and wait till the water, the water warms up, obviously we're in a very unique situation. I'm speaking if we weren't quarantined, um, but start with the, the most gentle basic conditions that you can experience and then watch the weather and find a place where you can actually 
deviate. So some of the harbors are tough because there's a lot of boat traffic during the warmer times. So finding a place where it's an easy launch and an easy place to get in and out and getting out in the conditions, you know, paddling with groups. I know Chris loves to bring a group out there. So getting with a group and going and chasing down, let's say a wind condition of 15 miles an hour with some downwind bump and you do that together, everybody can learn. So putting yourself into varying conditions headwind, side chop, you know, tailwind, some small ocean waves coming in and out of the surf, small surf, making it super obtainable. If you go to the wall on a one foot day and launch 50 times, all of a sudden you become confident on how to get in and out of the surf. If you go there and as Chris was saying, it's 10 feet, you're probably going to be so humbled that you're not going to ever want to go out again, even if it's one foot. So break it really down and have it as small varying conditions. New England's tough. We, it might be 70 tomorrow and then 41 the next day. So if you dress like it's 70 and then go out in the 41 conditions, you're going to be put into a, a not so fun condition, obviously a dangerous condition. So check the weather, find the conditions that you want to explore and, and go from there. That's the best way I would say to, to get used to the, the varying conditions and, and know your ability level. Um, that, that's a huge thing. You know, if you're brand new to paddling, it might be a summer of flat water on the lake. That's a great thing. Get your comfort level up, you know, go take some clinics, um, get some lessons. And then if you want to maybe go out into the waves, start on a super small day. So I hope that helped answer that one. All right. From the lakes region, AKA flat water heaven, how do I begin to try my ocean paddleboarding? This is an awesome question. Um, Joni, so I grew up here in central Massachusetts, so 60 miles from the coast. And I learned how to surf. I, I dabbled on a surfboard when I was 18. So I had legitimately no surf experience. Uh, 31, got into paddling and started surfing on a stand-up paddleboard. So I never really had a chance to learn traditional surfing at its basic level. Um, what I would say is if you're getting excited and you're up at the lakes region, there's a couple different options. Number one, getting comfortable in choppy conditions is huge because the whole key um, is basically getting used to the board to move. So what happens is when you're out in the ocean, um, the biggest thing about catching a wave, and Chris and I just talked about this, is the initial push of the wave from behind in the water movement. So typically when there's surf, that means there's current, there's all these different things. There's gonna be a rip coming out. So paddling in rough conditions gives you a really good comfort level on the ocean when you're starting to get into waves. So that's part one, paddle in rough conditions. Part two, one of my favorites that I learned in the lake is you can actually surf boat wakes. Um, and so, surfing behind a boat like if your friend has a boat and you take your stand-up paddleboard out that's a huge thing but the other piece is actually just chasing down these boat wakes so we do it in downwinding so you always want to chase the bump in front of you so if a wave goes by paddle as fast as you can at the back of that wave and what happens is all of a sudden you'll get a little momentum on the lakes and here you are you're like whoa now, how do you, you get that experience and you see, feel that same push from behind and, and it's a small boat wake. So it's not a massive waist high thing that's going to send you falling into the ocean. You probably will fall a few times in the lakes doing it because it's such a unique feeling. But that's what I, that's how I started to learn. I was chasing down boat wakes. So anytime a boat would go by, I'd paddle. And what you do is you paddle perpendicular. So the boat wake will go by, you'll handle it. And then you paddle as fast as you can. So you're perpendicularly putting the nose of the board into the waves and you'll surf that way. The other thing is actually wake surfing is a really great learning nothing. Game. So you can actually wake surf and then in time you can wake surf a stand up paddle board. Um, and the beauty of that is you don't need a big wake to wake surf. So getting those skills dialed is a huge part. And then when you head over Joni to the ocean, um, there's a couple options. Getting a learn to surf lesson on a foamy board is an awesome thing. Um, and that's a great thing too. So start small, start obtainable and uh, go from there. So hope that helped answer that one. All right, I think we got through all the questions. Right on. 
no worries on my name. It's all good. Glad you asked the question. <laughs> well, unless there's so, anything else, I mean, Jeremy, thank you so much for, yeah, this was awesome. This is a really, the breathing is a huge component of, I mean, in this day and age and where we are now, I mean, it's a huge takeaway for me personally. And I, I'm hoping, you know, that everyone that participated, they got something out of it. I'm sure they did. Yeah. Thank you guys so much. This was an awesome topic and I'll make sure I do have some videos on all the stuff we actually talked about. I have one on wake surfing and, and all that stuff from here in the lakes. Um, but yeah, get a hold of Chris and you guys shoot me a message on social media. Um, and uh, keep tuning in. There's a lot of great information coming out. So thank you guys so much. Everybody be safe. Yeah. And Jeremy, just a real quick, you mentioned social media. If, if people wanted to find you on social work, where can they kind of do the shameless plug here? <laughs> yeah, for sure. And I want to jump in. There's some questions coming in. Um, Steve, okay, you're cool. welcome. Thanks so much. Um, Jace. Jace's question is, last season here on Cape Cod, we saw our massive spread of fear because of tracking sharks. How do you think we should deal with that this year? So the shark mm -hmm. one is a really, really tough one. Um, and, and I'll just be super transparent. So I've lived in some of the sharkiest places around. Um, I have not spent time in Cape Cod, so I can't speak firsthand there. Um, surf New Smyrna Beach, shark attack capital of the world. Um, spent the last two years surfing in Jupiter. Um, very, very sharky areas, spent a lot of time in, uh, San Clemente, lived there for three years, surfed, and I saw great white juveniles every day, surfed up in San Francisco, um, inside the red triangle. So I've, I've been around these surf sharky areas. Um, to me, stay out of the hype. That is the biggest thing with it. You're going to have people that are going to say all these different things about sharks if you don't feel comfortable don't go in the water that's rule number one um be mindful of your surroundings um if it's a super super fishy day out there the sharks are going to be there um you know and so every area has their different things but to me and it's my favorite quote i, for, I forgot who told me this but someone said if you see a shark in a grocery store getting a ham sandwich we got issues so sharks are in the ocean understand that that is one of the things we're going to deal with and i know that they've had some attacks down on the ocean and, and my theory always is is driving to cape cod is way more dangerous than surfing in cape cod so be mindful don't cross the lines when they said shark sightings you know if the sharks have been feeding an area that's not, whether the waves are beautiful or not you're taking it on your own risk um, so just be mindful of that. And, you know, I know some people have been sh surfing in partners and, and other avenues. So, you know, those things are all great. You just gotta, to go with, with your gut instinct on that one. Um, you know, for me, like I said, I, every time we paddle out in Florida, there's a potential that we're going to get, someone could get bit, but you know, so far so good on my end. So, you know, err on the side of caution, be mindful. There is a bunch of information out there that to me that that is the most confusing ever you know somebody will say if you see seals stay away that means the sharks are coming my mindset always is if you don't see seals get the hell out of the water because you think about nature in its finest level if the seals are gone then what scared them away so there's a, a two-way street to look at it um that's been the biggest sighting i ever saw was that scenario that all of a sudden the seals are gone so you know the sharks are always a tough one Guys in South Africa and Australia have been surfing them forever. You know, the, this is new to the Cape. So, you know, just err on the side of caution. Be safe. Um, so I hope that I answered that. Steve, I don't teach any more um, WPA certifications, uh, but I know that they're going to be, there's going to be a really good one coming up for the ACA. Um, the WPA has done a lot of great certifications. The ACA um, provides some really great information. Um, and I'm not sure the date, but Chris can, can give you the date on that one coming up. There's a good talk coming. Yeah, that's coming up in a couple of weeks. So hold on, let me get the date here. Hold up. Um, Just go into the website now. There's actually a blog on our site you can check out. And Alan, thank you for joining us. Coral, you as well. Thank you guys all for 
chiming in here. Let's see. Yeah, we're going to be doing the, the ACA certification on April 26th. There you go. April 26th, Steve. So that'll have a lot of great information. There's ACA is American Canoe and Kayak Association. Very in-depth, very thorough. So um, check that one out for sure. They'll be able to give you a lot more information. And just a quick note on that, anyone that's registered for the webinar series, I mean, the, the login the registration code you use today to access uh, Jeremy's presentation is good for all six in the series. So I know next week, I believe we have uh, Jonathan Bischoff talking about how to find your perfect paddleboard so you'd be able to use the same credentials to use to log in to see, to hear Jonathan talk. Awesome. Well, thank you guys so much for tuning in. And yeah, my uh, social media, my name is spelled a little interesting, but as you can see right there, Jeremy Vane. So my website's jeremyvane.com, but uh, send me a Facebook or Instagram message uh, or get a hold of Chris, but I'm sure I'll be seeing you guys in the water for those of you that are local. And um, if there's any other questions that you come up with tonight or tomorrow, feel free to shoot me a message and uh, make sure you tune in next week. I know Jonathan's going to have a great one. Right on. Thank you so much, Jeremy. And thanks for everyone awesome, for watching. Chris. Appreciate it. All right. Thank you, guys. Have a great day. Be safe. Talk to you. Bye-bye.